Good morning, Paul. Good morning, everybody. We are so thrilled to have Paul Antonio Atom on with us for an interview today. This is so exciting for me <laughs> because I have a memory of Paul as a schoolmate and as a friend. Um, so seeing Paul shine in just being who he is, is such a treat. And the bigger treat is getting to chat with him now, 20 years later. Oh, 20 years. And well, it good afternoon. Like 20, 20 years at all. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Marsha. It's it really, you know, and so so one of the first things that I, I sort of want to to sort of say, hello, apart from hello and thank you all for for joining us, um, is so Marsha just said, you know, welcome to Paul Antonio Atong, and most of you don't actually know my surname <laughs> because I only really ever use Paul Antonio, and and actually a lot of people don't even know my my full name because most people just refer to me as P. A. Scribe. Um, and um, Marsha and I have been friends for a long time and I was so shocked to get this message and I, 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 I got this email and I just thought oh who is this and she sent a link saying oh so this is how it runs and she didn't, she didn't introduce herself or anything she said I've been doing this with my students to try and help them get a little bit more um, creative energy flowing if you if you if you'd like to help out, that would be great. Um, here's a link, you know, showing what the video works like. And I thought, okay. And as soon as I pressed play, I looked at her and I thought, and I, I was in my school uniform again, and she was in her school uniform, and we were laughing, and and I was so overwhelmed with this sense of of of, of joy and memory, just beautiful experience. I jumped on the phone and was like, oh my God, I can't believe it's you. So, um, so you know, you, you'll see me probably smiling a lot more in this interview than, than in most other interviews because, you know, when you, when, you, uh, when you make friends with someone so long ago and it, it's such a strong friendship and, and then, you, you, you know, I haven't seen her for 20 years and it, it's like, it, it's like, maybe 10 days have passed and we yesterday we spent um, we spent two hours on the phone talking about things and, and it was really quite amazing so so you know expect me to be a lot happier than the normal when I'm right so I'm going to give the the, the so Marsha has tons of questions to ask so let's get started and then I want to do some demonstrations so. all right so <laughs> this is an interview really about Paul and the reason that I asked for the interview is often we look outside of our country to find people to be inspired by. We look at people other than ourselves to be inspired by, people who look different from us, people with different cultural backgrounds, etc. And there are amazing examples right around us. So Paul may live in London now, and you hear a little tinge of London in his voice now because he has so many years of London infused in there. But you can hear that he's a son of the soil. He's from Trinidad and Tobago, I'm so proud to say that. And he's just played as himself. He's never pretended to be anybody else, even when I'm sure he would have gone through a lot of pressure to do things differently and to be different. That's not what he has ever been. And that's a big, big foundational message that I would like to pass on, not just to my students, but to everybody. You were sent here with a purpose. You came here with a purpose. Nobody forced you to be here, in my opinion. You came here with a purpose. And unless you figure out who you are and why you are here, you're never going to fill the hole inside you. So Paul, could you start by just telling us a little bit about your background? And then we'll continue from there. Um, I'm not going to say too much about my background because, you know, it's, it's you know, those of you who know me, you know, I, 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 I the one thing I will say is that, you know, I, I was very, I, I still am, obviously, because mommy's still alive, um, very blessed to have an absolutely phenomenal person as my mother. Um, you know, so many people know what, what we went through as kids because you know my father wasn't the best person in the world um, and um, 
And mommy really looked out for us. She looked after us. She raised four of us on her own. She worked very, very hard. Um, and she instilled a sense of purpose and hard work and determination in us. And she would, um, you know, she would, and I, I remember she would, she would put us to stand in a little semicircle and she would kneel in front of us and she would, she would touch each one of us over our hearts and she would say, no, just remember, it's just you and mommy. So you have to help me. And as we, we grew up, we, 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 we worked together very well as children. And, you know, other parents would always say to mommy, how come your children are so well behaved? <laughs> and we never got into trouble because we knew that, you know, we just had her to rely on. And as we got older, she would say things like, um, she would give us little bits of advice. And one of the things she would always say to us is, the only way out of this is through education. You have to get your education. You have to follow this path and you have to, you have to study and you have to do well. And she never forced us to do well. She just instilled in us that we needed to do well in whatever we chose. And, you know, she was, she was always hugely supportive. I mean, I was, I was out every day. I was in choir. I was in gymnastics. I was in scouts for a little bit. I was never at home or I was working in the supermarket or in the factory or, and, and, you know, and I never got into trouble because she instilled this sense of, of responsibility in us. Um, and that really sort of carried me through my life because I would always think, you know, I, I remember times that mommy was, she wasn't even feeling well and she'd still get up and go to work and she'd be on her feet all day working and then she'd come home and, and, you know, eventually I learned to cook. So I would start cooking because, you know, waiting for mommy to come home and cook was not fun because, you know, we were starving. <laughs> so, so I learned to cook and I fell in love with cooking because of my mother. Um, and then she promptly stopped cooking when I started cooking because I, <laughs> because she loved my food as well. So, um, and, you know, and, and that's something that's carried over into my life. I've always cooked. And of course, you know, Tim benefits quite a lot from that. Um, and, and it's great that, you know, Tim now says, okay, I want this and this and this and, and magic appears in the kitchen. Um, so it's my, my growing up in Trinidad. I, I think one of the great things about growing up in Trinidad is Trinidad is highly psychically active. There is a lot of energy beautiful energy flowing in, in Trinidad. You know, there's a connection to the earth and to the, and to the forests um, that really make you feel whole. Um, and I think that, that, that has also affected me as I, as I sort of, when I moved to London, you know, I was, I was always attracted to history. And so when I studied calligraphy and heraldry, um, it was always with, illuminated manuscripts in mind um, with, you know, Egyptian hieroglyphs in mind. I fell in love with Egyptian hieroglyphs in Trinidad, you know, through books at the library. And, you know, and I found myself in, in Egypt drawing hieroglyphs in the pyramid to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And that, that was something that I, I never thought was possible. Um, and I think when I, I, I remember looking at my, my Egyptian hieroglyphs books and I must have been like maybe 11. And I, I thought I, was, I would just pack them away because I never thought I would leave Trinidad. I never saw that I would have the opportunity to leave. And I never thought that I would end up in a pyramid working on hieroglyphs. Um, so, so you really have to pay attention to the things that, that touch you as a child because when you are that connected to something, it's, it, it obviously means something. It obviously has um, some kind of impact later on in your life. And you know, I, I never thought that we had, as, as Trinidadians, a, a lot of opportunity. Because when you look outside, you see the kinds of opportunities that that people in developed countries have. 
and no, I, I'm specifically talking about the time frame that Marsha and I grew up in. You know, there was no internet. <laughs> you know, you went to the library and you, you hunted for information and you fell in love with it. Um, but you also had access to the forest. And, and it was safe then, you know, our, our parents would let us out and we, would, we, would be, we, we wouldn't get home until midnight. And you wouldn't even get a scolding for getting home at midnight because nothing would happen to you on the streets, which is, a, unfortunately, it's a very different situation now. But that gave us a, a freedom and, and it allowed us to touch things that I think a lot of children today, not just in Trinidad, all, all across the world, don't have access to. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so so let, let's move to the next question. <laughs> um, when you think about how your vision has evolved over the years and how your work has evolved over the years, what would you say your vision is now and how did it emerge and evolve? I think talking to your students directly on something like this, um, I, I, I'd want to be a little bit more pointed about this. You know, mm -hmm. I... I think because my mother was always so supportive, you know, I was in the choir, I was in musicals, I was on stage, I was in theater. Mummy came to every single show I did. I mean, not, not every night, but she was always there on either the first opening night or she came throughout the, and, and sometimes she came like three or four times. Um, and that, that kind of love and support is really quite amazing. So those of you who have children, you know, you, you have to support them. It doesn't matter what they do. You really have to support them because that support really changes them, really gives them purpose and drive. Um, but I, I fell in love with calligraphy in Trinidad. And, um, you know, I started when I was about nine. I was really lucky as well because when I went to presentation college, Mrs. Gonzalez, had a handwriting competition and I, I wrote a letter to her recently and I heard from mummy that I wrote letters to mummy and my aunt Fran and Cheryl Ganny, who was the art teacher at Prez, you know, until recently, who's a friend of mine. And um, Mrs. Lee Mack, who I love like a mother, Mrs. Gonzalez, which, and, and now that I'm old enough, I can say this, Mrs. Mrs. Gonzalez, which, you know, Marvin, Roger, Richard, and I would always call Auntie Phyllis behind her back because we, we have such a strong connection to her. And she really helped to, to guide us and to, 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 to give us purpose as well. And, and she really helped with our diction. <laughs> um, and, and all these people really affected us. But my vision started when I fell in love with calligraphy. And, you know, I love geography, and Trinidad is a great place for geography. I taught geography at Prez, and at um, and Richard, <laughs> so Richard Leslie just come on. Oh my God, oh, scandalous! Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm taught, this is probably the, the the happiest I've ever been in an interview because I, I just feel I feel so close to all my friends, my Trinidadian friends, and my Trinidadian family. Um, and I think people who are who follow me as PA scribe have never seen this side of me really. Um, and so Richard Leslie just came on. Richard is like a brother to me, you know. The Richard, Marvin, Roger, um, just really quite. You know, if if it wasn't for Mrs. Lee Mack and and her pulling us together as a family in that choir, so many of us would not be where we are. So, trying to keep on track with Marge's question and then Richard came up and wreaked havoc again as always. Um, I, I fell in love with calligraphy and you know, I had a couple options, you know, I could have gone and studied music, which Marvin did and Marvin, Marvin and Roger, exceptional at music, Richard went off and he did dance. Um, I didn't love music the way that they did. And as, as, as lucky as I was to have a good voice, I didn't have that passion for it. My drive really was calligraphy. I really fell in love with it. And eventually, you know, I taught handwriting at, at, at St. Mary's. And, um, and then I, 
I won a scholarship to, I came to the UK and I won a scholarship to go and study letter form history at Reading under some amazing tutors like James Mosley and Michael Harvey. And then I won a scholarship through the Commonwealth Foundation Arts and Crafts Award to study what I wanted to study. And I went and studied calligraphy, gilding and heraldic painting. And then I had some more money off uh, from that. And I went on to book back to study manuscript history, Arabic calligraphy and archeological illustration. And the archeological illustration is what helped me to end up in Egypt. Um, but I, I, mommy always told us that, you know, God has a, a plan for you. You just have to be open to it. And things sort of push you into different directions. And, you, you know, it's great to have this kind of organic growth in your life. For your students, I would, I would, I would caution them to be a little bit more direct in their growth because you know, I, I was lucky when I went to Rygate that I, I was very good at what I did. But you know, the problem with being very good at one thing is you're not good at anything else. Mm. And so nobody tells you how to find business. And if you're an artist, learning how to find business is a real problem. Nobody teaches you about accounts. And when you paint and you then look at numbers, the numbers jumble up in your head. So learning to manage your accounts and manage your business is, is a really important aspect of growing up. And it, it might be that you, 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 know, you, don't, you, don't, uh, you don't become a freelance artist or you don't become an independent con consultant and that you have a job with somebody, but you still have to learn to manage you know, your bills. Simple, simple things like that, that, that a lot of people take for granted, which some people really struggle with. And, you know, I, I'd, I'd really caution you, if you struggle with this kind of thing, to really make a point of learning how to deal with it, because it will save you so much hassle later on in life. Things like, you know, how do you direct your career? So, you know, I was very fortunate that I was really good and people came to me for work because my work spoke for itself and other people would share it and say, oh, this guy's done all my place cards. Look at what he's done. And so other people would come to me, but at no point did I actually go out there to find work because I didn't really know how to do it. And I think, you know, 20 years ago, there weren't really online, well, obviously 20 years ago, there weren't online courses uh, teaching you how to do this kind of thing, how to help direct your business. You know, things like making a business plan and um, coming up with a business model. These things were so alien to me. And, to, you know, for the most part, they still are fairly alien to me because it's, it's, Something that I, I, I just never really think about. So putting that kind of, of, of um, framework together for yourself is really critical. And, you know, I was fortunate that, you know, I, I, I remember reading about the scriptorium that the monks had. And I was like, oh my God, I would love a scriptorium. Wow. To mm -hmm. have books and inks and quills and and vellum and just to have it in, all in one place and just to be this magical space. And that was, that was sort of my goal. You know, I, I wanted you know, other people to be in the scriptorium. And, and for a while that happened, you know, I had a really great team when I had a studio in Clapham. Um, and then I moved um, to a smaller space. And, and I remember sort of sitting in the smaller space in, in, in Chilton Street. And I was very, very close to sort of giving up. And I sort of stacked out and I said to God, if you don't send me an apprentice and somebody to help, that's it. And the next day I had two emails from people saying, oh, can I come and see you? I was like, oh. mm -hmm. And, you know, I know in this world of technology, people, um, people just, they struggle to believe. And, and your faith is really important. 
you know, when I when I struggle, and and, and even when I'm not struggling, because mommy mommy always said to us, you know, God is real, and if you feel alone, God will be there for you. All you have to do is talk to Him. And sometimes when I'm struggling, when I'm when when I'm really struggling, I I can feel I can feel God. I can feel his presence helping me and supporting me. And I have somebody to talk to and I don't feel alone. And even when I'm not alone, you know, I will sit in the studio and I'll sort of say to God, oh, what do you think about this? How about this? How about this? And, and it's, it's like having a support network that's there for you. And I don't know how people go through life not believing in God because, I, I mean, that's just, you, you're just alone. And... Um, and so having that kind of faith has been really helpful. You know, Marsha talked to me about this yesterday. I said, I didn't really want to add this into the interview. Um, but, you know, I, I nearly lost the use of my thumb, my right thumb, through repetitive strain injury. And I eventually found Reiki. And the Reiki really helped to stabilize the pain in my thumb. And Tim has seen me do Reiki with people, lots of people. Um, and he has seen profound changes in the way that that Reiki has affected them. And Mummy and I had a long conversation about them. Marsha and I were talking about this yesterday, about, you know, how do people who, how do you look at something like Reiki? Because, you know, a lot of people think that it's a spiritual thing and they are afraid of it. And for me, it's, it's, it's just another expression of energy. You know, you know that, you know, you know that liquid solids and gases exist. So there are other forms of energy that we're still discovering that, that they exist. And somehow we tap into this thing and it, it can stabilize us, it can help us. Um, and, I, and that has also helped me in the way that I've set my studio up. Because, you know, um, I remember when Alice was working with me, I would do Reiki with her every day. And she said it, it really helped to calm her to open her mind, to accept more information. And I've done Ricky with students in classes and watched them just, just, just break down because they feel so supported by it. Um, and, you know, there's, so, 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 so my vision, getting back to Marsha's question, <laughs> um, was to have this scriptorium that was an open place, that, that was a comfortable place for people when they visited. And most people, when they visit the studio, they, they love it. You know, lots of people come, they sit, and they don't really want to talk because they love the flow of energy in the place. What I'll do is I'll, sh I'll show you very quickly what the studio looks like. So, oh, we'd love that. So this is a... So when you come in, come in through that door, and, and you come in and you see some books, right? So I was really lucky to do some work with Spellbinders and I have a really nice press from that. But these are, so this is some gold Tim helped me to grind. So I ground some 24 karat gold in honey using an eighth Indian, uh, eighth century Indian miniature painting recipe. And then I grind some of these pigments. So that's, that's cinnabar, which gives us vermilion. Here's orpiment, which is really, really toxic, um, but it's the best yellow you can get. And then there's malachite and lapis lazuli and tons of gold. And, and I, I, I love books, you know, that's something mommy instilled in me. And I collected all these books and then you come into the studio proper. And so there's more books and more pigments and more books. And then this is my like sort of working desk and there's, there's books under there too. And there's books under there. And then this is a shelf that's of, of, of tools and materials which arrived because I, I was really lucky to work with Rodia, which is a really amazing international brand to make these pads of paper, three blocks, which I'll talk about later. So that's, that's the table I'm sitting at and I've set up my camera. Um, so you can see there in, in that ring of light so you can see it. And then that's my area. And then that's my book that I wrote on copper plate strip. And I, I wanted somewhere that, you know, you could see all the tools. They were all out. I love the brushes. Um, I've been really fortunate to, to, to make friends with some very, very good people 
um, in Hong Kong who, who again are like family to me. And, you know, mommy always used to say to us, when you make friends, make sure, make sure they're like, they become family because then they're really, really important. I always wanted a blackboard. <laughs> um, and then this is my little office. So my, my sofa is, is really high off the floor um, because I just like to sit at it rather than get up and then my computer's there. So, and then there's lots of stuff here. So there's, there's tons of stuff which Tim keeps telling me, you have too much stuff. <laughs> um, and so in your mind, it's not enough stuff, right? You want more in? <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what's in all those books because you're a practitioner and an artist and and an artisan and lots of people think when you do you maybe don't read as much so what I, do those books hold for you I, I, I I'm in a slightly different category to most to most practitioners I most people who study calligraphy they want to write and all my students you know, they want to write. They just want to pick up a pen and write. And I always tell students, you know, 80% of your practice is thinking. Because if you sort out the problems mentally, then when you sit down to do the practice, you actually know what you're going to do. You know how to enjoy the practice. So if you spend 80% of the time figuring out the work, you spend 20% of the time enjoying the writing rather than spending 80% of the time complaining about the writing because it just doesn't work. I was really fortunate that I was able to study English manuscript history from uh, 600 to 1600. So I was able to do lots of manuscript research in, in a field called paleography. And that's a really sort of, it's, it's, it's like historical academic calligraphy. So you spend more time looking at illuminated manuscripts, looking at the script, trying to understand, uh, in, in most instances, what they're saying. But for me, it was trying to understand how the scripts were written historically. Um, and so a lot of these books are about illuminated manuscripts. And because I also studied heraldry, you, know, you need lots of reference materials for heraldry. Um, there's a huge section on Egypt, which I love, you know, I love Egypt. I, I, I fell in love with, I, I actually went on to study Middle Kingdom Egyptian. And so I learned to translate um, Middle Kingdom Egyptian, which was, which was such a, a joy. After I came back from Egypt, you know, the, the dig archeologist, the lead dig archeologist, Dieter Arnold said to me, you have a real affinity for Egyptian. Why, why, don't, you, why don't you do something with it? And I came back and I went and I studied um, Middle Kingdom Egyptian translation at Birkbeck with uh, Joe Clayton. And, you know, one of my very good friends, Stephen Quirk, was the chief Egyptologist at the Petri Museum of Egyptian Archaeology. So, I, 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 you know, things, things sort of happen to, 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 to push you along your life. Um, and, you know, I, I, love, I love Arabic decoration and I have a really nice Arabic sort of gallery uh, sort of section here. Um, and, I, ma I made friends with this really amazing woman in Kuwait called Lubna. And, and it's just, you know, these, these, these magical connections, all, they are always there. You just have to be open to them. And I think a lot of people are, are not open to them because, you know, when you're sitting in front of a screen all the time, you're not out there, you're not yeah. making that connection. So. But I have a, a further question to ask because it sounds to me like when you follow your path, opportunities arise, doors open, and you walk through. It's not that easy. There's fear, there's self-doubt, there are limiting beliefs. How have those played a part in your life and how did you not let them stop you from opening the door and stepping through? Um, I, I won't lie that, you know, one of the biggest problems that you have when you are driven and you're young is you struggle with older people. Because some older people see this, this ball of energy and they want to help you. And others see you as a, as a threat. And 
and, and and this you know this is something that is this is something that I, I encountered in Trinidad that I found really frustrating. You know, a lot of older people in Trinidad don't think you know what you're supposed to know. You don't know enough because you haven't been doing it long enough. And I found that really quite quite annoying and offensive because it 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 assumes that you don't you haven't put the time in. Um and that really affected me for, for quite some time. And then I got to the point where I thought, you know what? I'm not going to listen to what other people say because I know how good I am. I put in the work, not just with the practice, but also with the reading of it. Um, I follow up on my practice. I help other people. And when I help people using the methods that I've come up with, I see a result in their work and they see a result in their work. And so you, you have to get to the point where you have to overcome that self-doubt. The self-doubt that other people instill in you or, or, or force onto you, you have to either just walk away from it and do your own thing. Um, and you know, it's, it, it's not easy because you know, when, you, when you decide to strike away from the pack, you're out there on your own. And so you, you really have to, to dig deep. And, and you know, again, this, this comes back to, to my mother. You know, mommy really, we, we watched her raise the four of us on her own. And we were lucky that my, her mother, my grandmother, you know, she helped. And my aunt, Fran, she helped. We had really good neighbors who helped. Um, and just when you, when you grow up with that kind of, of, of determination, you, you really have to draw on it. You know, I'm very, very close to my mother. You know, I talk to her as often as I can. Um, I laugh with her. I mean, I'm really good friends with her. Uh, she's really good friends with, with all the people I went to school with because they, they're like her children as well. Um, and that really instilled a sense of community in us. You know, Marvin, Richard, Roger, and myself, we are still very good friends. Um, and you can't do this alone. You need, you need that support network because you might sometimes just need somebody to talk to. You know, I, when I wrote my book on Copperplate Script, I was struggling with editing it and I called Marvin and I said, can I send you something? And I sent him this book and he said, oh my God, did you write this? And I said, yes. He went, oh. I said, do, do you have time to proofread it? He went, I, I will start tomorrow. And he sent me back this massive write-up. Oh, you must have stayed up like two days to do this. And when you have that kind of, when you, but, but you know, it's your responsibility to build those kinds of friendships. You know, they are not magical things. They don't just happen and they don't just stay there. You have to work at them. And I think a lot of people don't understand that kind of, that kind of work that has to go into a friendship. And, 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 the, and, and that kind of friendship that is there for you for the rest of your life. Um, you, know, I, you know, Richard was away for so long and we were all in touch with each other by Facebook. And you know that you could just send somebody, someone a message and just say, hi, I'm just checking up on you. And that message was like, you sent that message yesterday because you know that that message will carry that person for you know, the next three, four, five, six, seven months. Um, so having friends to support you is really important. Having your community behind you is really important. You know, those of us who move away, you know, I, yes, I, I, I miss my family terribly all the time. And, you know, sometimes I sit at home and I just start crying and Tim is sitting there and he's like, I know you miss your mother. I know you want to see them. But, you know, and mommy also said to us, build those friends close to you so that they are your family. And so those people help you through that kind of self-doubt. You know, they help to push you. They help to, sometimes, so, sometimes you call them and they just let you talk or you let them talk just so that, you know, you, you can hear yourself thinking. 
I like that you have a small group that has remained your core friends. And what I know from looking at you, Richard, Marvin, and Roger back then was that you all were not friends because you were thinking of any end game. It wasn't that I'm lining this up to help me down the road. It's genuinely that I'm there to help, to serve, to connect, because we share something. And looking from outside, I didn't know what it was. It was all the choir boys lining kind of thing. But you know what it was, and that's all that matters. That you that's don't go in there trying to manipulate any relationship for any other reason than I genuinely no. like you and want Marsha, to. All it was was a Friday night to go down to Karamat's roti shop. That's all <laughs> it was. <laughs> Good memories. <laughs> that was right around the corner from home and from my home too. I know. Go so, uh, Paul, you wanted to do a little demo where we could see yes. you work. Now would be a great time. Now All right. on Zoom, I suspect we may not get Zoom to share the screen that you're working on as well as this one. So what I, I will think... do is I will mute this one, your iPad. Mm -hmm. And that way we'll hear you speaking while you do your art on the other. Okay. okay. I am just trying to set it up. All right. You, you can unmute your, good, there we are. All right. Okay, so. Brilliant. This should have. I might have to take this one. Is this one of the pads that you worked with a publisher to make? Uh, no, so this, this is a... Give me a second. Okay, great. All right, so I just need to see if that's bright enough. So this is a layout paper pad, which is made by London Graphic Center. And it's, it's, it's reasonably thin so that you can see um, the guide sheet behind. Um, the pads that I had made with Rodia are these ones. So this is the black pad with my okay. little PS Scribe logo. And this is the gray pad with my PS Scribe logo. Um, and what you get from them eventually is... So you have a lined pad. So the lines are really faint so that they disappear. Uh, I and then, and so I, I've been doing these lives to show how different tools work on them. So that's that sheen machine ink. Oh yeah, now see it, yeah. Um, right. So then, these, these are just, this is just what I've been doing over the last couple of weeks. Um, and you can see with the black um, that you can write using the lines as well. Just see. Right, yes. And I, I wanted something that people could, could practice on other than white paper. I then wanted something that people could um, write correspondence on. 
So I showed mommy this letter so I can, I can show you this. So this is, uh, I showed mommy the she machine ink and she fell in love with it. So I wrote her a letter mm -hmm. on my pad and you can see that Beautiful. So there's the back as well. Oh, wow. So uh, what I wanted to show you, because uh, you know, uh, the, the, the aim of this was to reach your students. And I know I have some followers on and um, I'm great that they, yeah. grateful that they've come. Um, but let's, many, let's show some of your students. Many people are saying now, Paul, that handwriting is a thing of the past. It isn't important. Um, computers can do it. And you show us why writing beautifully counts, why it matters. It's, it's really important. Because, you know, when you write, you embed a little bit of yourself into that page. And if you send that to someone, it really changes them. For someone to get a handwritten letter, it, it gives them so much excitement. You know, I'm, mom, mommy said that Mrs. Lima called Fran and said to her, this letter arrived and I still haven't heard the full story. So I'm still waiting to hear about that. Mm -hmm. And I sent, well, I mean, you know, I sent those letters two months ago. I sent one to Richard, one to Marvin, one to Roger. So Roger should have his by now. Um, and it, it, it's amazing how, uh, I, I don't just mean a calligraphic handwritten letter. I mean, just normal writing, just take your time to write a letter to someone. And that there's so much about writing. You know, we know that if you, if you write your notes, there are neuron pathways which form and they help you to remember. So there's, there's a lot around writing. So okay, for your student, this is one of the scripts that a lot of people know me for. So this is called Copper Plate Script. And one of the great things about the script is you can flourish. You can add lots of little bits to the flourishing. The only problem with this is you have to know when to stop. Because <laughs> you could fill the whole page. <laughs> now... Did you flourish and miss the message? Well, I, I, think, I think the problem is you just get carried away. <laughs> um, so I'm going to grab a marker. So one of the other brands I do a lot of work with is a brand called Kurataki. And they're a great company. They make really super tools. Where is this? I, you know, I'm looking in my little Kurataki. I don't know. Oh, that's a brush book. 
the what is Zig school and worth? Maybe not the pink. <laughs> so this is the scroll and brush. Um, and the great thing about this is it gives you a split line. Practice is actually a little bit taller. It should be about here. And um, the first script I really fell in love with something called textualis quadrata. Now, my first calligraphy set was a speedball set. Mm. And I was at uh, Creative Asian, and I met this crazy woman called Angie Van Gallis. And Angie and I spent a lot of time together. She's amazing. I love her so much. And she looked at what I was doing and she said, oh, you should, you should talk to Speedball about this book. It's just like, whatever. And eventually I got in touch with Speedball and they published my Copperplate script manual. And when I went to see them, I said to them, you know, I, I still have the holder um, from my first set. That's and, two, what's the other one? Oh, okay. And because I still had the holder from my first set, it really sort of, it, it was really amazing being able to work with this brand that had changed my life. And I remember going into the speedball factory and there was this, this woman sitting there checking the nibs. That's her job. She checks all the nibs. And I said to her, how long have you been here? And she said, oh, about 40 years. <laughs> and I said, you would have checked the nibs that I used when I was nine. And your nibs changed my life. And it was, it was such an amazing experience to say that to someone. Um, so these... So, so this script, Textualis Quadrata, looks like this. Oh, no, no, leave it, leave it where it is. Okay. You just need to mute where you are drawing. Okay. So it's very methodical. It's very, it's, it's, it's almost mechanical. And, you know, it's the first script that was converted into, uh, into hot metal to, to make fonts, uh, to make type so that they could print the Bible. Um, so the Gutenberg Bible was the first Bible printed using this, this kind of letter form as the basis for the, uh, for the type to print that Bible. So it's a great starting point. I, I love starting students with this script because it sort of ties them to, to our writing history and our printing history in, in a really interesting way. And 
So these are basically, you know, the sort of standard scripts that you learn. And then you know, recently we've had different types of scripts using, using brush pen. Okay, I've switched you over again. So now you're, you're on the cell phone, okay? You can unmute there. Let's see. So these brush pens are a lot easier to use because you don't have to dip um, and they allow for a form of script that resembles copper plate script. But a lot of people use them for another kind of calligraphy, which sort of came on the scene about maybe seven to 10 years ago, called modern calligraphy. Um, and it's, it's very loosely based on copper plate script, but in the last sort of two years, it's really sort of expanded into lots of different kinds of scripts. Um, no, uh, I'm just trying to give your students a real um, overview of some of the other things that they can see calligraphically. So this is a ruling pen. So this is an, an adjusted uh, pilot parallel pen. And where, where the original ones are straight, so you can use them for formal calligraphy. These ones are chamfered and they create different kinds of lines. Oh, I'm just having to change the direction of, uh, that I'm sitting at. So you can get a thin line, a thick line, a thicker line, and you can get a real sort of splattered line. Mm. messy. Um, right. That's beautiful. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So let's let's switch back to the iPad. Okay. I can switch the all right you're on you can switch your audio on. All right great. Now, it's not easy to get a lot of tools and materials. I was lucky because I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was also lucky because there were lots of turkey vultures on the beaches in Trinidad. <laughs> and so we naturally have quills cured for us to write with. Today, we have a lot more access to tools and materials. And um, those tools and materials, they're not always cheap. Um, so knowing how they work, and this is one of the reasons when, once my pads came out with Rodia, I was really conscious because I was, because I'm so lucky to have these great connections with all the suppliers that make calligraphy tools and materials. I said to them, send your products in and I will test them on my pads so that I will show people what works and how they work so that you're not wasting your money because I, if it's one thing I hate is people wasting money. You know, it's, it's the same thing for wasting food. And Tim will tell you, you know, I would prefer to sort of hurt myself by just stuffing my face than watching food go to waste. Um, I wonder what culture you came from. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I also made, um, I work with a really, really good friend of mine, um, who is, who is like a brother to me, his name is Telmo. And um, 
he really helps me with all the graphic design work that I need for the, for the, um, you know, for, for PA scribe. And so what we did was out of the, the manual. So that's the manual there. The manual is really rich and full of content. And I, I invented a new system to teach the script oh. because I felt that the old system that we were using was failing a lot of the students. And, um, you know, when people teach copper plate script, they give you a pen and they give an exemplar and you're basically trying to copy what they are showing you. Why well, I thought that this, this, this was crazy and that you needed to give more structure to the teaching of the script. So I invented this new system that I referred to as a fourfold symmetry. And the book is full of so much information. And I wrote the book because of how my crazy mind works. And I thought, you know, I'll put everything in the book and that way everybody can learn it, right? Well, of course, not everybody thinks in the same crazy kind of way that I think it. Mm -hmm. So people look at the book and they're like, what is this? <laughs> so, I, so I'm working on a workbook um, out of the teaching material. So I have this great teaching material. I wonder if it's here, if I moved it. Uh, where is it? I think I moved it off the desk. Um, I have some great teaching material that I use for teaching in my workshops oh. that I'm turning into a workbook that will complement the, the, the manual, which I never thought I needed because the, the manual is so complete. Uh, well, let me make a plug for, for your fans and for me. If you find it and you're willing to give us a, a sneak peek of one piece in the comments of the video that we'll post, we'd love to see it. I will, I'll, I'll post something. Um, but you know, Mummy always used to tell us, and this, this, this has always stuck with me. She always used to tell us, you are here to help, not hinder. Mm. And you have, when you can help, you have to help. And so I, because of my particular way of seeing my craft, I, I look at real minutia that most people never think can affect the way in which you work. So I did these three videos and I put them up on YouTube called Posture, Placement and Position. And they teach you how to sit, where to place the page, how to hold the tool, things that you would take for granted. And lots of people who watch those videos have said that they have dramatically changed the way that they write because they're not suffering. You know, most people when they write, they're like this. And you're hunched over the world, squeezed in, so you have no ability to move there's no freedom of movement so the posture video looks at that and i wanted to do some more detailed videos based on those um and you know at the beginning of lockdown and um, tim and i moved the kitchen around and we made these five and a half hours of content which we put up for sale on the shopify site because you know the other three videos are still free they're, they're just like 10 minutes each but these videos are they're pretty intense and there's a lot of content. But out of the manual, I took 18 pages, 18 things, pages of things that I thought people needed to have access to for free. Because, you know, you, you have to help, right? And I would never have done calligraphy if I didn't win a scholarship. I could never have afforded it. And there, when I teach, whenever I go abroad to teach, I always have one full and one partial scholarship that I give away. Because sometimes people just can't afford it. And they might be so gifted and so blessed, but they just don't have the finances. And so, you know, the, running the scholarships are a bit of a nightmare because you have to get people to write letters and sending work. and You have to read this and do that. But it, 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 it has given some people a real break and real inroads into, into learning. And so I thought, you know, out of the manual, I would make this PDF of some of the essential information. So we call it the essential information extracts. So we made this free. It's like, it's so bright. There we go. Um, 
So you can download this off the PA Scribe Shopify site. And then coupled with the launch of the, of the Rodia pads, I also, I, I'm, also, I'm always thinking, how, do you, how, how can you simplify this process? Because people always say, oh, calligraphy is so difficult. And I listen to this and I'm like, no, it's not. It is not difficult. You're just approaching it from the wrong angle. So I came up with these um, copper plate script training wheels, um, which looks at the script in a very, very different way. And I did one for um, the slanted copper plate script, which is the natural form of the script. And I did one for an upright version of the script, which eventually leads to a form of a script that I developed that I, I wrote out some text and I called mummy and I said, what do you think of this? And she said, oh, that's really beautiful. I really like that script. What's it called? Mm -hmm. I said, I've decided to call this script, Judy script. Oh. And she said, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Oh my God, you've called something after me. And I said, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, because her, her handwriting is something that I, mommy, mommy's handwriting is beautiful. And of course, you know, I had to learn to forge her signatures because I, you know, all children learn to forge their parents' signatures. And her form of handwriting really stuck with me. And it helped me to develop this Judy script that, that I was only too happy to, to call after her. And so the upright copper plate script is a form of copper plate that's upright, but it's all, these are all done with pencils. And um, because I also wanted them to be accessible to people who didn't have access to expensive tools. So those two PDFs are also free and you can go on, on the website and download them. Um, and there is video content with them. So when you download them, you don't just get the PDFs for free. You get the video content that talks you through how to use the PDFs. So a lovely um, demo video. That's one. Yeah, really quite detailed videos. Um, and, and there's tons of stuff on the website. You know, if, if, if you have purchased the manual, you can get the yin and yang approach, um, which is what the, the name of the, the subtitle of the manual is. You can get all of the grids to help you learn the script, um, which is, you know, I think there's something like 20 grids. And then we have this new PDF up there, which teaches you small capitals with a pencil. And we'll, we'll, we'll be doing the pen version of it recently. Um, so and I we will have make a building. sure to share the link to your, to your Shopify yes. page in the comments when we're done. Uh, in the comments to the video when we post it. Okay. So I know that we are, I think we're about an hour into the interview. Okay. Um, and, and really, I think all of us would love to keep going. But here's the big, the, the last question that I have for you. What's your message of inspiration? I was going to say for the young adults and the people of Trinidad and Tobago, but, but it can't be just for us. What's your message of inspiration for people everywhere? Oh God, you have to pray. <laughs> really. You know, I... I cannot stress how important it is to sort of sit. You know, I love my sofa. I sit on my sofa and it, my sofa is huge. You know, I'm six foot four. I could lie out on my sofa. I sit on my sofa in the smallest corner of the sofa. And I sit there and I talk to God. And I'm like, oh, I'm really struggling with this. Can you help me with this? I'm really, really frustrated. I can't see how this will work. And, you know, I've been having some problems with the structure of the website and trying to update it and do this and do that. And, and I just, and both tell and I are working on other things. And, and, and I, I basically sort of talk out everything that I need. And someone in one of my groups sent me a message and she said, I see you're struggling. And I said, yeah. yeah. She said, you know, I can help. And I was like, really? She said, yeah. And she sent me a list of stuff that she could do. And I was like, what? Yeah. And, you know, when you, when you, and okay, fine. If you, if you decide that you don't want to believe in God, that's entirely up to you. But, you know, we are all connected to the universe in a powerful way. And if, when you put that out there, 
you tell the universe that there is a problem that you are struggling with, the universe listens. You just have to have faith. If you don't have faith, I, I, you will never get through the day. And that's not just faith in the universe. That's also faith in yourself. You know, when I teach calligraphy, I teach, I try to start with the really basic things. You know, I always start my students off with straight lines. Can you write a straight line? Simple, simple, simple question. And if you think, yeah, yeah, I can write a straight line, chances are there is no way you actually know how to write a straight line. So you have to always go back to basics. You know, we, 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 we start creeping, we learn to walk, then we learn to run. But look at yourself walk. Are, are, are you walking properly? Is your back hurt? Is your leg hurting? When you sit down, are you in pain? So something's wrong with the way you're walking. So even as an adult, you are doing things that are incorrect. Go back to basics, you know, sit up properly, breathe properly. And we forget that, our, that, that these basics, they're not just something you learn at the beginning. They, they are things that you have to keep going back to. Every time you go back to a basic, you learn more. So, you know, some advice, always go back to basics and, you know, don't, don't think you could do it alone. I appreciate All right. that so much. Paul, thank you for your time. No, your thank love you. For putting yourself so fully into this interview. Richard! We all appreciate it. <laughs> so, um, for viewers, we are going to end our interview recording now but we are going to open up the mics and spend a little time, 10 minutes maybe with Paul, and we can all have a nice chat off, off recording. Thanks for joining us. Thank you again, Paul.